Da sind wir wieder zurück aus der Pause und wie angekündigt kommt jetzt hier schon unser nächster inhaltlicher Beitrag. Ich bin super, super happy, dass äh, wir den Jörg gewinnen konnten, dass er heute für uns hier sprechen wird. Ähm, Jörg ist nicht nur ein Kollege hier am Fraunhofer für Jese bei uns, sondern Jörg hat eben auch noch jetzt eine Professur angenommen im Bereich äh, Digital Farming. Ähm, und jetzt fragt ihr euch vielleicht, was zum Teufel hat denn jetzt Farming mit dem Pfaffhack zu tun, wenn wir hier von einem Stadtquartier reden, dass ähm, äh, das gemacht werden soll. Aber genau diese Frage, die wird der Jörg uns jetzt gleich beantworten. Und äh, ich freue mich mega, dass du hier bist, Jörg. Und ich übergebe auch gleich mal das Wort an dich. Du darfst dich gerne selber vorstellen und mit deinem Talk auch loslegen. Super, vielen Dank, Patrick. Herzlichen Dank für die Einladung. I think I switched to English because I heard that many, many participants here in the PuffHack are English speaking only. So I offered to give the talk in English. So uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Thank you very much for the organizers here, for the, the whole PuffHack team for organizing the PuffHack. I really, really appreciate your dedication and that you do this um, together with all the people that participate. So great that you participate in such an event and have your creativity here in, in this hackathon. Yeah, my name is Jörg Dörr. Patrick already uh, announced me. I'm at the Fraunhofer IESE. There, I'm there for over 20 years now in a variety of different positions. Now I'm in the Extended Institute Management, heading also there the program Smart Farming, and I'm at the University of Kaiserslautern heading the chair of Digital Farming. And yeah, what do I want to bring to you? First of all, I want to uh, tell you a little bit what is digital farming, because I think this is a really cool societal topic, how we eat, what we eat, how this is grown, and we should care a bit more about that. And in the whole digital farming topic is very closely related to sustainability. And that's something that should drive all of us very strongly. And I also will tell you a little bit about how digital farming becomes a little bit more regional and more maybe even into the city centers and give you some examples there. I'm looking forward to that talk. And whenever you have questions, feel free to ask also at the end. I'm very happy to answer any kind of questions and come into a dialogue with you. So first, I want to tell you a bit more what is digital farming cost. This term is also heavily overloaded. And I want to show you this kind of uh, picture. And there are so many IT solutions when it comes to digital farming. On the very top, you see here information systems. Maybe you all use a kind of Google Maps-like uh, system. This is called a geographical information systems. And the farmers also use these systems, not for not Google Maps, but similar systems there. And they are developing over the time into a whole um, world of connected farm management information systems. You can think of like an enterprise resource planning system, an ERP system for farming. This is kind of a great support in the IT world with the laptops and the desktops. And on the lower part, you see the embedded systems. We have so many cool sensors and actuators in farming that tell us about the weather, that tell us about soil properties and so on. And um, they are, of course, also connected to larger vehicles. So we, we are going into the direction of autonomous systems, self-driving tractors on the fields or harvesters. And these are really complex systems, also sometimes called cyber physical systems, because they interact so much with the, the overall technical and, and, and world. The, the implements that are drawn by the tractors, they are pretty intelligent nowadays and they can do a lot of stuff. And not last uh, part are the mobile systems here, the smartphones and the tablets. There are so many applications that support the farmers. I also brought you some, some video of one of the applications there, what, what they can do with some smartphone app already. And all these systems, they come together in what we call, besides the biological ecosystem, we also nowadays have a digital agricultural ecosystem with many, many applications that somehow have to work together. And there is a lot of data involved, and that's why you see here at the bottom, there is the potential to do big data and learn from how they grow the, the vegetables, how the, uh, they grow the corn and so on, and uh, yet transfer this knowledge also to other farmers. So with one sentence, we can say digital farming is the software supported optimization and automation of one, the agricultural processes, the work processes, like for example, the harvesting or the seeding, the planting, or the, the fertilization yeah, of, uh, of the plants, and also the business processes, for example, when it comes to selling the goods then, or like direct marketing and, and new business models, that's also part of digital farming, so pretty broad actually. For me, the digital farming is a really interesting field of research. There is highly relevant and a current research field. There is a lot of things going on. There are ex exciting challenges also. It's not all solved yet, 
and it has a, such a strong impact on our society on our everyday lives yeah we all want to eat good high quality food and how we yeah, grow it it also has a big um, uh, a big influence on our um, yeah, sustainable life but also on how our landscape will look like yeah if you drive here through the area you will see a lot of wine yards you will see a lot of fields and just imagine that's all gone what is there then so this is also a, a question of landscape design yeah the markets and the technology almost change every few weeks new products come out and new technology we see here so it's a topic with a big future which you can really influence well so i want to also encourage you to go in that direction and here in our region we have the, the association the friends of digital farming and there are many many uh, companies gathered together and said we want to push the digital farming topic you see here basf john deere empolis huda pestle instruments itk engineering but then also farming associations like the Hofgut Neumühle, up to then the um, Hochwald who produced the milk and even Aldi are there in this association and they all want that the digital farming uh, gets more powerful and more used. At IESA, I said, we have this uh, research program with many projects and we have this slogan, Fraunhofer IESA is the partner for digital ecosystems and platform economy in agriculture, so we don't do everything but there is a big need for platform economy concepts and ecosystem topics there. And at the university, the chair digital farming offers lectures. So maybe you, if you are at the university or have already have seen the foundations of digital farming lecture, we have seminar topics, projects like the software development project with the farm bot. I will tell you what that is later because that can also be interesting in our living areas. And of course, we have some job offers. I'm seeking for people that want to go in that direction and uh, do some research in digital farming. So let's come after I told you what digital farming is and hope I could convince you a bit that this is really an interesting topic. I want to talk about digital farming and sustainability in our society. And I hope that you all know the UN United Nations SDGs, the Sustainability Development Goals. So if not, please visit the website and, and browse them. And there are 17 of them. So like no poverty, no hunger and having a high quality education and so on. And now just take a look at this kind of graphics and think, how is agriculture related to these sustainability goals? You just take a moment and, and reflect where agriculture is somehow related. These are 17 goals and almost half of them are directly impacted or interconnected with the agriculture. Well, no hunger, yeah. No hunger, the agriculture brings our food so that we can eat. Good health depends on what we eat. The clean water, you all know about the problems with the fertilizer drowning through the soil down to the water and we have some problems there. Renewable energy, a considerable amount of biomass is used also in the farming areas for creating renewable energy. Responsible consumption, climate action in general, the impact of our farming on climate, that's a, a really um, big issue. Life below water, if we think about also farming not only on the land, but also the animals that are in the water like fish and life on land, of course, all the kind of cows that we have, uh, cattle raising and so on, that's, that's all related. So you see agriculture and our sustainability are so closely related and we should think about that. And that is really in the in the current time. This is a really challenging a challenging situation from a societal perspective. And I want to talk with you about that. The world's population, you know, is still growing. We are changing our eating habits. We are eating more meat in many many regions in our world. And in many regions, we have really high quality demands when it comes to food and the processes. So one farmer needs to feed more and more people. We have a very, very interesting statistics that how much, how many people are fed by one farmer. This is growing and growing over the last years. And that means we need a higher yield. Yeah? We need to get higher productivity from our fields because the, the, the amount of space that we grow our food on is limited. And we don't want to extend that. You all know this just now in the, in the, in the, in the news about that we want to keep our forests stable and we don't want to uh, cut them just to, to have more space to grow. So we need higher yields. That's the one, one, one uh, stream. Now here comes the other stream. The world's population has more and more emphasis on sustainability, which is correct. Yeah? We need the sustainability. We need to take care of our climate. And we have more and more emphasis also on food traceability. So where our, how our food was produced under which conditions. And in the, the political framework, especially in the industrial nations, says don't use these chemicals. Don't use these kind of um, yeah, techniques in order to grow. 
you want to have you want to have more biodiversity you know about all these kind of um, talk that we have about the bees that are reduced and that the birds are reduced so as a result of that we have a lower yield yeah, because we, we cannot use some kind of crop protection because we cannot use some kind of techniques for that so and these is contradicting goals so you have a very really strong pressure on the farmers here and the farmers they are seeking how can we get out of that yeah? and digital farming can be one part of the solution not everything we will see there is bio um, genetics and other kind of stuff that can also help a little bit here but the digital farming use of technology there can be really an important part for that solution so achieving a high yield a good productivity but in compliance with sustainability and a careful use of the resources that's the goal that's why we do this kind of digital farming so now I didn't really tell you so much about what is digital farming and I just thought I'd bring you some examples I bring you some videos of what is digital farming and what is not and on YouTube you find also funny videos here like this one no this is not what I mean with digital farming we don't want to have the QR code on the cow and we don't have the cow walked by roads that's not the case but let's see what it is so I bring you uh, um, I brought you some videos here and just to talk and this I think is really a nice example. So let's see what what uh, what uh, digital how digital farming can support sustainable agriculture. L'ampiral, un papillon dans les chenilles, peut anéantir jusqu'à 40% d'une récolte de maïs. Pour détruire les œufs de ce ravageur, des agriculteurs de la Drôme larguent dans leurs champs des micro abeilles appelées trichogrammes, un ennemi naturel de l'ampiral. On ne fait que reproduire ce qui se passe dans la nature, mais à plus grande échelle. Donc on a récupéré des trichogrammes dans des parcelles de maïs et on a démultiplié ces trichogrammes dans une biofabrique pour après les lâcher en grosse quantité dans les parcelles de maïs. Et pour être à mesure de traiter des parcelles avec des grandes surfaces, on a développé des systèmes de lâcher par drone. Les trichogrammes sont conditionnés dans des capsules biodégradables d'un gramme qui sont ensuite largués dans les champs à un rythme de 180 billes à l'hectare. Le drone offre une grande capacité d'épandage par jour, sachant que la période d'épandage du trichogramme elle est programmée par les vols de pyrale et doit se faire sur quelques jours. Et lorsque ces capsules vont tomber au sol, l'élévation de la température va aider les trichogrammes à poursuivre leur développement et ces trichogrammes vont sortir par les petits trous qui sont à la surface des capsules. Dans chaque capsule, vous allez retrouver des trigogrammes qui ont été conditionnés à des stades différents, ce qui va nous aider à protéger la culture pendant plusieurs semaines. Ça fait à peu près 20 ans que du coup, on utilise les trichogrammes pour lutter contre le ravageur du maïs. Avant, pour les trichogrammes, donc, on accrochait des capsules aux feuilles tous les 10 mètres à peu près, pour qu'après les trichogrammes puissent s'éparpiller autour. Et donc maintenant, grâce aux drones, c'est lui-même qui fait le lâcher euh, un peu partout euh, dans la parcelle. Le drone a vraiment facilité du coup notre travail, puisque nous maintenant on reste au bord du champ euh, et on peut aller s'occuper de toutes les autres tâches qu'on a à faire dans l'ex. Ok, thanks for watching with me this video. So I think this is such a cool example. So you don't have to put chemicals against the corn borer for the corn, but you use the trichogramma. And in the past, you, you heard this lady was using that technology, this biotechnology, so to say, for over 20 years. But they need to hang this on each uh, plant there. And now the drone is just flying. They are dropping the capsules. And you can even imagine that this can be extended, this kind of technology, only to drop the capsules in, in areas where you can also um, find out automatically with digital farming technology that the corn borer is active. So that is one example. This I promised you to bring also an example of a mobile application that um, that helps the farmer. So this is really uh, something which is not very expensive. You don't need to be able to fly a drone or even buy a drone. So let's take a look what this uh, app can do. So you see the farmer spots something in his uh, field that he maybe doesn't know by heart or he's unsure what, what this kind of is. And he just uses the mobile app to take a, a kind of quick snapshot of this uh, kind of wheat that is there. And then this app will tell him what you just took as a photograph is a cleavers. And even though the app can go further and recommend some kind of 
ways uh, how to treat this cleaver to get it out of the field. Yeah, and this app can do even a bit more, maybe just briefly to, to give you an impression. What you see here is the, the farmers sometimes put these kind of yellow traps into the field and then the insects, they fall into this kind of trap and they just take an image of the, the insects that are there and they this app just counts the number of insects and tells you have so many um, insects of that um, um, kind and another uh, kind here in there and you can see if you have an infestation of insects there and then treat uh, the field accordingly. So you don't have to do this as a kind of uh, measure in advance, but you do it only if you really have the, the stuff. And maybe uh, uh, one which is really interesting because uh, in many cases we don't have to treat the whole field. In our current technology, many times we just do a kind of fertilizing or a crop protection on the whole field. And these fields can be pretty big. Rather than that, we want to be more and more plant specific. And this is just an example here. Um, how we can be really much more um, plant specific and don't treat the whole field with some kind of equipment. We apply the first nitrogen dressing across the whole field. The second and third nitrogen applications are site specific using the Isaria crop sensor. We're in the winter wheat, the variety is Tobac is currently at growth stage 51, which is the ear emergent stage. We want to show you how we apply the last dressing with the Isaria crop sensor. The crop sensor is an active plant sensor which assesses the right fertilizer application for different crops. It uses information about the current nutrient supply to the plants and their biomass. So you saw this kind of device that is in front of the tractor, it scans at runtime, so to say, live. Um, what is the current status of the plants? Is, are they growing well or not? Are they not growing very well? And what is then in the end at the rear of the tractor, you have a facility, a two disc spreader that spreads fertilizer on the field. And I told you the fertilizer, that is really a tricky thing because we don't want too much of this fertilizer to run through the plants and go to the water. So you only want to fertilize the areas that really need the fertilizer. And that is then what is happening once the, 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 the camera spotted the biomass. The only way of achieving ideal fertilizer distribution and the fertilizer is applied exactly where it is needed by the crops and where it can be used efficiently. This is also reflected by the recorded sensor measurements. The single terminal makes operation very straightforward. The recorded data exactly match the crop development on the ground. This supports our confidence in the system. So this should just give you an idea in the large field what is happening in our product. So what we get in our living areas is produced on such a field and we take care about sustainability in, in the digital farming and there's a lot of things happening. But all of that comes now closer to our living areas. And I just wanted to briefly give you some example how that happens. The first, yeah, let's say emerging technology there to name is the vertical farming. So we, are the, we don't have one area on a flat area and we just have one layer of things to grow, but we have stacked on various, um, yeah, on various layers we grow the vegetables, for example. And this, of course, can then not happen only in the rural areas, but that can also happen in our city centers that we have even whole warehouses with many stories where we uh, try to grow our vegetables. Of course, you already know the non-technical version of how it all comes closer, some things like community gardening, but there is not so much digital farming evolved, maybe we'll see in the next slides. But the community gardening is also an, an, an interesting concept so that everything comes a little bit more regional. Even it can come to our quarters and into, into our living rooms. So maybe, I don't know if you have seen such kind of technology here, what you see in the middle, um, pretty expensive still, but that's always in the beginning. That's uh, the plant cube indoor smart farming system. So you can grow your own um, plants in such a kind of device. It's a small company in Munich that's created that agri-illusion they are called, but on pretty expensive. On the right side, you see a little bit less expensive versions. You have a, a kind of vertical farming for indoor on the very right side, on the lower right side here. This looks like a shelf, but it's a pretty intelligent shelf. Uh, it's by the company Click and Grow. It's the 
um, the wall farm vertical indoor garden they have a kind of special kind of soil a kind of smart soil they have specific lighting conditions they control the water status and will let you know when you need to water it and that's um, the, on the top here that's the the smaller version you have small pots where you, the seeds are in there and they have the perfect nutrition supply uh, there is a kind of lighting scheme that ensures a, a proper lighting and it also has a control for the water supply. And you see, these are areas how the, the, the farming and some kind of digital farming technology starts, really starts to move closer. It's still too expensive for everyday people to do it, but just to, to, to give you an idea, that one is a four digit uh, expense. That one is a two digit expense. Yeah? So you see that it, it's moving in, in some good direction. So that is in our living rooms, but we could even imagine that in a quarter, like in the Pfaff area, we get some digital farming technology there. And I just want to show you this kind of device. That's the farm bot. Um, it is based on a kind of, you can say a small robot that takes care of seeding, watering, mechanical weed control. And it has a camera on, on the top and some kind of devices that can, for example, push the weeds down into the earth. It can water the kind of plants and it's controlled here with a, what they say a drag and drop farming approach. So you see a lot of plants there here on the screen and you can say, I want something to be seeded in this and that corner. And these kind of devices, they are available in two sizes. The so one is one and a half on three meters and the other is three on six meters. Yeah, so you, you see that um, that's a size where you could imagine to have it in the garden. Of course, we know all of kind of problems about uh, that this kind of stuff uh, could get robbed or whatever, but this could, could also be uh, some interesting technology um, to be used there. And the last part, also a regional focus, the direct marketing. I'm just giving you here one example, um, the Hof am Weyer, that is a, a kind of uh, farmers that do uh, organic uh, farming and they have uh, then a direct marketing web page where you can select which kind of product you want to have um, and they will tell you is that regional product or is that from Germany or is it from other area in the world and how it is grown and give you some nutrition facts about that and then this kind of a box um, with, the, with the, what you just ordered is shipped two days later to your door. And um, that is also something where you now are in a position to select what kind of, how it was the food grown, uh, what you want to get uh, to, to your home. So these are just some examples on how the digital farming now comes closer to our homes and our, our home door. Uh, but of course, you also need to understand what is happening on the field and, and the technology there to better judge this. This is not the kind of picture that we have from our TVs that everything is done manually and um, the cows, there are single cows there. It's a kind of, um, we need for our productivity also to have it. Um, we have a sustainable but high productivity production. If you're interested in the topic, this is an announcement. Next year, there will be a book published, Handbook of Digital Farming. And it's not only for, for expert audience, it's also for students and interested people. And it gives a really, really big a portfolio and a summary where digital farming is used in which areas, livestock and uh, on, on the farms out there. And maybe you are interested in, in, in reading it. So I want to summarize. I get seeing Patrick is getting more and more nervous because I'm exceeding more and more time. <laughs> no, I want to summarize my talk now. Sustainability is a core topic for our society. I think you're participating also here in the PathTech because you're aware of that. It's really affecting our all parts of our lives. And digital farming technology will be a part of the solution for sustainable agriculture. We are pretty sure about that. We can achieve a, appropriate yield with sustainable means and we, we really need to carefully uh, use our resources. And the digital farming is often in the countryside, yeah, outside of our cities, but there are many concepts evolving that link this kind of agriculture much and much more closer to our everyday life. And yeah, just the last sentence that's um, important for me. Sustainability will not be done by the others. Yeah, we can look in the news what they are now negotiating, but they, it will not be done by the others. We all have responsibility for it. So take care about it. And I hope there was some new part or some interesting part in this talk for you. And enjoy the perfect. Thank you very much for inviting me for that talk. Yeah, thank you, Jörg, for uh, being with us. And thank you for that very, very interesting talk. Um, I, I really liked it. There were so many things in there that I really felt are so interesting. And I also have seen the connection that we can draw to the topics that we have in the Fafec. Um, there's also a question uh, from the chat. 
And um, I, I really think that's an interesting question because you have, uh, you've talked about the digital farming and also about the aspect how it's brought into our daily lives. And, and the example that you have with uh, buying the, the local foods and the local groceries is something that is really down, down to earth and, and affecting our daily lives. But the question from the chat is, um, if, uh, or how the digital farming is used for, uh, for modern businesses and things or projects like the mission to Mars from SpaceX. Um, if this is also relevant there and if there are maybe even more far ahead. So I think this is really an interesting, uh, far looking question here. I don't have um, the, the data or information how SpaceX is, is doing that, but um, honestly, we have to think about how we feed our, um, our, our people if we really want to have a long term mission in, in other areas. So the whole concepts of vertical farming, growing things in, um, in not on the soil, but on, on let's say smart soil also, they will have also a kind of um, outreach on this kind of visions that we have for the future. So I could imagine that the um, digital farming technologies there contribute very strongly. And let's say that's often, uh, I think, a kind of dual or triple use that you use technology, let's say here in our uh, local communities, you, you use them in the in the landscape, but maybe you will also use them in very, very controlled environments. You know about the experiments probably that take care about how people can live in, a, in an encapsulated area without outside communication or putting in re, uh, resources or getting resources out. And there, of course, these kind of new technologies um, and, and the for especially the, the knowledge that is gained in, in vertical farming can boost these kind of developments. But I'm not personally involved in this kind of activity. So, uh, but uh, that is definitely something that is uh, very interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. And I also got one more question. Um, what I wonder is all this, this digital technology and, and all these new things that are coming up and these solutions, that they could even be some kind of intimidating maybe for the user. So uh, how do you uh, approach the, the acceptance of the end users? Because Maybe if you say a farmer is someone who is very down to earth and maybe not so much into digital technology, which could again be something that is comparable to our situation in, in PUF. That is a very, very interesting and a good question. I could have even paid you for that question in advance. So thanks for bringing that up because that is one of the three top topics of my chair at the university, how to deal with the end user acceptance of the digital farming technology. Because we know the adoption rate of digital farming technology is pretty low. Yeah, even the ones that really contribute to sustainability. And there are a variety of reasons why this is the case. And we are trying to tackle this because we really see exactly what you mentioned. On the first part, the, the farmers themselves, they are sometimes reluctant. And that is um, not because they are so critical about the technology, they just don't know what will be the effect of using the technology, right? So if they say, I don't use chemicals, but I rather use the technology, who would pay me if I get less yield? Yeah. So this is a really danger for the farmer. So we are really working on studies to find out what are the core reasons for farmers to have problems with that. There are studies also from 2018 roughly, but um, we want to go into more detail in our research to understand what are the core, let's say, showstoppers or enabling factors to, for the digital farmers to use the technology. And to be very honest, if the technology doesn't bring any benefit, we shouldn't propose it. It's not digital, it's cool. Digital is just a means for the people. And then I want to come to a second dimension, the people. If we talk or if I go, um, take a look at some of the organic farming communities, they make advertisement with um, a slogan that says that our produ products were produced without technology. And this is a very strange situation. They do that because there is a demand from us or from a certain group uh, inside our society that says, I only want to um, consume products that were produced, let's say, in an old fashionedly grown way. But if you think about that, what, what is that? We have digital technologies that save our resources, that contribute strongly to sustainability, but the farmers might not use them because the people will not buy it because they don't, don't understand that the technology makes that better. So if we would put um, or, organic uh, fertilizer on the fields and we use some kind of copper, which is a kind of um, 
the, the thing for the organic uh, farming, this is also not good for our water and our environment. Rather, if we would use a digital farming technology to uh, do, do that on a mechanical level, like a mechanical weed control with an autonomous robot, which exists, yeah, it's, it's out there in the market for different kinds of plants. This will save our environment. It will contribute much better to sustainability, but the people wouldn't buy it because it is badly grown with an autonomous robot. So we have to also rethink a little bit about this in our uh, society. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So maybe if you think about the last one and a half years, we, we have seen a bit of a skepticism against uh, science and, and, and things that are coming up. So maybe we need to learn also to better explain what we are doing here. I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> so there was one more question uh, from the chat. Um, a very specific question about the video that you have shown with the with the drone flying over the field and um, I cannot remember the exact name. Uh, the Trisho uh, Trichogramma is yeah. the corn borer, yeah. Yeah, and then the, the question was uh, what these things are, are doing. So I'm not sure if you can if you want and really can explain this right now here, but um, if you can give a short answer for sure, otherwise we can maybe send the, the, the link to the video also in, to our participants. Definitely we can uh, send the link to the video, but the basic principle is, is that the trichogramma is a natural enemy of the corn borer. How they directly fight it, I think they put their, uh, you know, their, um, their eggs somewhere which is then affecting the corn borer, but how it exactly works, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a, a bio biologist. For me, the interesting part is the uh, outreach of the uh, trichogramma capsules or with the trichogramma inside um, with the drones. So I only know that they work pretty well and it's a pretty effective means, which is completely biological and you don't need the chemicals. But the exact um, causality, how they um, do it, it's just a natural enemy. So it would also in, in, in nature, the trichogramma would hinder the corn borer for um, spreading. Yeah? But I can, I'm can. i very happy. I think I put the link on the YouTube video there, but I'm not sure if they explain how that works. Okay, great. So we can share the link uh, with our participants and, and maybe uh, they can find more information on the internet as well. Yeah, I think there are no more questions left. So thank you very much. And I, I really enjoyed the talk. And what might be also an interesting piece of trivia, last year there was a team um, in the Perfect that were creating a solution. They called it Beet Brudi, and it was an app to support community gardens. So this really is a perfect link to last year, and this is also a perfect link to, we are really looking forward to the solutions that we will be seeing in a few hours. And Jörg, thank you for joining us. Um, thanks to all the participants for watching, and uh, we will see you soon with the next talk, and after that with the pitches. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the perfect.